Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our program, So You Want to Be a Federal Contractor, sponsored by the Snyderman Law Group and Santa Massimo Davis, Outside General Counsel Solutions. We're really happy to have you today because uh, this is an important topic for businesses, especially in the current business climate. It's, it, I think it's an excellent opportunity for companies that aren't currently doing business with the federal government to think about uh, the opportunities that are before you. Uh, what you're going to learn today is a series of topics that will hopefully empower your company to become a federal contractor and take advantage of uh, what you'll see as a huge uh, sale opportunity with the, the federal government being perhaps the largest or one of the largest uh, procurement uh, customers in the market today. So we'd like to help uh, help partner with you to make, uh, make it easier for you to, to take advantage of that opportunity. So just to review briefly the agenda. So this is a two day program, about two hours each day. Uh, day one is today, obviously, and we wanna talk about the basics of becoming a federal contractor, export controls basics, cybersecurity and CMMC certification, workplace and re remote employees. And lastly, Office of Federal Contract Compliance Programs, OFCCP and audit preparation. Day two, uh, we'll get into some insurance coverage concerns for federal contractors, tech transfer from federal labs, PTAC, the procurement technical assistance program, compliance and ethics programs, and lastly, records retention and audit preparation. All important topics. I'd like to hand the, the mic to Mark Snyderman to talk a little bit about his firm, the Snyderman Law Group. Thanks, Chris. Uh, we're excited to be here today and uh, tomorrow and look forward to what a significant amount of great content that we're going to deliver to you guys uh, and I uh, hope you enjoy it. Uh, Snyderman Law Group is uh, really formed uh, around the concept of disruptive lawyering. So we like to say that uh, we, we do things a bit differently. Uh, we think a little bit differently because we're not only lawyers, but we're also business people. Uh, I happen to have been the COO of a government contractor here in New Jersey uh, for about 10 years uh, and helped that company grow from uh, the better part of 15 million up to about 60 million in revenue. We had about 300 employees. So this is a field that we're very familiar with, not only from the legal side, but also from the practical side, having been uh, in operations in the business. Uh, and Antonella was my, uh, my deputy general counsel when I was at the company. Uh, so we have a pretty significant uh, expertise in the field. We're looking forward to sharing some of that with you guys next week, next few days. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Mark. So I'd like to introduce you to our firm, uh, Santa Massimo Davis. We're a specialty law firm uh, with offices in New Jersey, New York, and Philadelphia. And we work with clients all around the country in the mid-market space. Our lead offering is called Outside General Counsel, where we'd like to bridge that gap between what a mid-market company needs to satisfy its legal concerns and the traditional hourly billing model that they face when they go out and buy legal services. Those two don't quite off the, those two often don't give companies what they need in terms of a strategic legal solution. We'd wanted to bridge that gap and make our firm the equivalent of an outsourced law department so that our team of 14 becomes the equivalent of an in-house law department uh, for mid-cap companies. The way that we do that is to offer our services on a fixed monthly fee, which makes us more accessible uh, and makes, uh, makes our services more strategic so that companies can uh, call on us early and often to prevent problems, run their business more smoothly, and avoid some of the regulatory hassles that you'll learn about today for folks that's, that uh, don't follow the rules. So with that in mind, I'd like to turn the mic over to Antonella Colella, who will discuss uh, the ins and outs of becoming a federal contractor. Thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you, Chris. Good morning, everyone. Um, so we're going to start at the beginning and talk about how to become a federal contractor, or really how to do business with the federal government. We're going to be talking about how the government buys things, and it's very different from how you or I would buy something. And then we're going to talk about cost accounting and how to build your rate so that you can be competitive to the government and win business. So 
So why sell to the government? So the US government is the largest buyer of goods and services in the world. We spend over $535 billion each year and over 100 billion with small business. So this is a very strong statistic um, to show that it's, you know, it's very lucrative and it's a good idea to do business um, with the government. Um, they are a good customer. They pay and they pay on time. The DOD itself is the top purchaser of goods and services in the world. So you really can be missing out on um, a lot of business if you're not selling to the government. So how does the government buy? In most cases, the government cannot just decide that they want to buy something and then reach out to the supplier and order it. There's a maze of federal rules and regulations that govern how the government can go about buying a good or service. The reason for that is really to be transparent um, and protect the government and its citizens and show that it has integrity in its selection of suppliers. It's designed to offer a fair competition to all different types of contractors, large and small, disadvantaged and not. So as I said, fair competition is really an important tenet of government contracting and there are different types of competition. So full and open really means that all vendors are playing on a level playing field and they have the same opportunity to compete for an awarded contract. And here there's no set asides for small business. Full and open after exclusion, this really means set aside. So these are contracts that are set aside for 8A companies, which are minority owned businesses or service disabled businesses or small business owners. Other than full and open, these are non-competitive awards. This really is sole source. Um, this allows a single supplier to fulfill the needs of the contract. These are not favored. They're not used that much. They're really only used in certain circumstances such as exigent or an urgent need for something. Um, and maybe there's not enough time to go through the whole procurement process. Or maybe the government put something out to bid and they did not get adequate sources. Or also it's used in the case of industrial mobilization during wartime, for example. So the contract amount, if the contract amount is under a certain dollar amount, there are alternatives to putting something out to bid. So this is called the simplified acquisition process. When choosing a vendor in a simplified acquisition procurement, agencies don't have to bother with formal evaluation plans, establishing a competitive range, conducting discussions, or really scoring offers. Um, also, a contracting officer and not necessarily a source selection team can choose the contract winner. Um, so it's, it's really more streamlined process. Um, and other contracting methods include sealed bidding or negotiated procurement. But so for example, under $10,000, um, the government can purchase something just with a credit card very easily. If you're in the middle here, if you're under $250,000, but above 10,000, you can still use the simplified and streamlined acquisition process. If you're over 250,000, you would need to go on to a formal contract. The rule of two. So the government does have certain small business set aside goals. They try to award a certain amount of contracts to small businesses. The rule of two offers an automatic set aside to small businesses if they comply with this rule, um, which says that contracts with an expected value over 150,000 must be set aside for small businesses if there's a reasonable expectation that offers will be received from two or more competing small businesses, that the award will be at fair market price. So there has to be a need. That's the, the reason for the two um, competing small business requirement. So this applies to new contracts and it also applies at the individual task order level, um, it, you know, if the task order is part of a larger IDIQ contract. This just shows the stages in the acquisition cycle. It is a process, it can take several months. Um, so the pre-award stage is really when the government is analyzing its need and determining which acquisition vehicle it needs to take. Um, for example, full and open, or can they do sole source, or do they have to set aside? The solicitation and award phase, this is they release the bid, they evaluate the proposals, and then they award. And then in the post-award stage, it's really the performance of the work. How are you getting paid? How do change orders get handled if there's a modification? And then finally, contract closeout. 
There are many types of contracts um, that are set forth in the FAR. Um, the contract types really define the expectations, the obligations, um, the incentives and rewards for both the government and the contractor. So the main types um, that we're going to talk about today are firm fixed price and cost reimbursable. So they differ really in the amount and nature of the profit incentive that's offered to the contractor and, and the degree of risk that's taken on by either party. So this is a sliding scale of the allocation of cost risk. So with firm fixed price contracts, the contractor really takes on all the risk here. Under a fixed price contract, the contractor agrees to deliver the product or the service at a price not higher than what was agreed to in their proposal and that was accepted by the government. So he or she needs to deliver the product at the price they told the government, no matter what happens. If there's overruns, if there's changes in cost, they still need to deliver at that agreed upon price. So firm fixed price contracts are used when the requirement is well defined, if the contractors are really experienced in meeting that cost and they know um, how much it's gonna cost them every time, when market conditions are stable um, or when financial risks are otherwise insignificant. So for example, you would not use FFP for fixed price for an R&D contract, for example, because you don't know what that outcome is gonna be. Cost reimbursement or cost plus is a type of contract where a contractor is paid for all of its allowed expenses up to a certain limit, um, plus an additional payment to allow the company to make a profit. So these contracts um, provide for payment of allowable costs, which we'll talk about um, in a few slides, um, to the extent that it's set forth in the contract. So they include an estimate of the total costs um, to obligate the funds and they establish a ceiling that the contractor cannot exceed, except at, at its own risk. Um, and it you know, should not exceed that without the approval of the contracting officer. So the government holds more risk here because they don't have a definitive price from the contractor. Other types of contract, indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity or IDIQ. Um, there are a form of contract in which the contractor is required uh, to deliver an indefinite amount of supplies or services over a set amount of time. So these are typically five-year contracts, but it's, it's very common that they'll contain options to extend the time after that. Um, a way to think about these are that services or goods are guaranteed throughout the time period, but they're only delivered when the need arises, when the government needs them to. So this is, and that's done through delivery orders and task orders. Multi-agency contract, that's an interagency contract uh, that can be used um, by other agencies. Government-wide acquisition contract, or GWAC, that's also an interagency contract. It's just um, allowed under a different statute. Blanket purchase agreement um, is a simplified acquisition method, so it's technically not a contract. Same thing with um, OTAs or other transaction authorities. Um, under BPAs, agencies use it to fill anticipated repetitive needs for supplies or services. So how does the government decide which type of contract um, is going to be selected? So there's a lot of factors that go into that. Um, the need has to be carefully analyzed. And they take certain things into account like urgency. How fast do they need the good or service? What's the period of performance? If it's shorter, it's easier for both parties to determine their needs and their costs. Um, for example, does the contractor have an approved accounting system? If it's for a fixed price, there's no direct need for a, co a cost data from the contractor's accounting system, although it's good for a contractor to, to have that. 